So, ladies and gentlemen, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the fourth online roundtable of the Malaria Game Changer series. My name is Joost Wagner, and I'm going to be the moderator today. So, innovations to address drug resistant malaria is our topic today. And we're going to be joined from many parts of the world. So, for some of you, it's morning, for some of you, it's afternoon, and for some of you, it might be even the night. The Malaria Game Changer series gathers senior officials from Asia Pacific, malaria programs, national regulatory authorities, manufacturers of malaria commodities, and global health partners through a webinar discussion on existing and new tools and strategies to advance both health security and malaria elimination in the region. As you can see on your screen, there sh should be three round table already happened, one on diagnostics, one on vector control, and one on Vivex malaria. And this is now the fourth one. So in our round table today, our discussions will focus on the threat of drug resistant malaria to the 2030 elimination goal, information sharing on using existing drugs to combat resistance, information on new treatment combinations and compounds in development to address drug resistance. And last but not least, share opportunities to accelerate the safe introductions of these innovations. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, mechanics, but I will come back to you more in detail later. But um, we are on two platforms. You can see the speakers um, only on the screen, but um, if you have a question, you can write in the chat box and I will get, with the help of my colleagues, these chats will then be transferred to my screen and I will choose uh, questions for our experts who are joining us today. So I will talk about the mechanics, how we run the, the show later. So I give first the word to one of our co-hosts from Appelma and Atman. With us, with us today is Dr. Marie Lamy, the Director of Policy. Over to you, Dr. Marie. Thank you, Jost. So on behalf of uh, the Appelma and Appman Secretariat, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for our fourth Malaria Game Changers Roundtable. It's really a pleasure to be co-hosting this session together with Moru um, and with support from the RBM Partnership. Our CEO, Dr. Sartak Das, extends his sincere apologies. Um, he was not able to attend today due to a scheduling conflict, but he wanted me to share that Appuma and Appman together will look forward to helping sustain progress on addressing drug resistance in the greater Mekong sub-region um, as, as well as beyond. So we should note first that malaria programs in the region have made tremendous progress in containing multidrug resistant malaria to date, and we'll hear more about that later. Among other partners, the APMEN Working Group on Surveillance and Response has also helped us understand where the pockets of malaria lie and how we can best target interventions. Despite all of these efforts, resistance continues to pose a challenge to the 2030 elimination goal in Asia Pacific, and so that's why we look forward to hearing from our panelists today on what tools are currently available and what tools are coming our way to help us address this challenge even better. So we hope you enjoy the session today and we really look forward to hearing your questions and your comments throughout the event. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marie. And now I will hand over to our co-host, but also expert on the panel, Professor Ayan Dondop to provide some welcome remarks. Ayan is no stranger to the, in the world of malaria. He is professor in tropical medicine at Oxford University and deputy director of Mahidol Oxford Clinical Research Unit here in Thailand. He heads the Department of Malaria and Critical Illness at MORU, the Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit. And he studies a diversity of experts of infectious diseases and especially that are causing significant morbidity and mortality in the tropics. Dr. Aryan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Yo. So also on behalf of Moru, uh, a warm welcome to everyone who's attending this uh, roundtable dis discussion. I think we have a very nice uh, lineup of uh, panelists and we have a very interesting topic to cover, uh, innovations to address antimalarial drug resistance. Uh, 
big problem in the Greater Mekong subregion and and could extend expand to the countries around it. Uh, many topics uh, that can be discussed, uh, new uh, drugs to treat drug-resistant malaria, surveillance tools, uh, and also everything around malaria elimination, because malaria elimination is in the end the only way to get rid of uh, drug-resistant uh, malaria. Um, those topics have been discussed many, many times in many, many meetings over the last uh, years. I think what is nice from this uh, meeting is uh, the format uh, that we have a panel discussion uh, moderated by Yoast. So uh, I hope new things will be, uh, be addressed and not only the technical things, but also how to implement them, how to operationalize them. So I look forward to a nice uh, 90 minutes. Over to you, Yoast. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ayan. And I would now like to call upon Dr. Pascal Ringwald to provide opening remarks and give us an overview of the issue of multi-drug resistant malaria in Asia Pacific. Um, Dr. Pascal is currently involved in the global anti-malaria drug resistance surveillance and containment effort as a co coordinator of the Global Malaria Program in the World Health Organization. Dr. Pascal joined the WHO in 2000 as medical officer in charge of global monitoring of anti-malarial drug resistance. So he brings a vast experience to the table. Dr. Pascal, over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Joost, uh, for inviting WHO to this uh, very interesting webinar. Um, just to give a little bit to set the scene of, of, the, of the problem in the Greater Mekong. As you know, Greater Mekong has always been considered at the epicenter of uh, uh, anti-malarial drug resistance, and this moved uh, even to multi-drug resistance. But we have to uh, emphasize today that uh, Greater Mekong is no more the, the only epicenter. There was also epicenter in South America, and more recently, Africa has become a small epicenter of emergence of artemisinin resistance. So just to explain why the Greater Mekong was such uh, an issue for everybody, um, this was uh, coming from the monitoring of anti-malarial drug efficacy, uh, and I will discuss the technique uh, later. Um, and uh, during this, uh, this monitoring of the efficacy of the ACTs, because the Greater Mekong uh, countries were the first of implementing our currently used ACTs, the artemisinin-based combination therapy, during monitoring the efficacy of these drugs, uh, we, uh, the country discovered uh, very rapidly that there was a delayed clearance, which was not usual with the artemisinins. And this led to further investigation uh, around 2005-2006. Um, this, uh, th this was funded by the Gates Foundation and coordinated by WHO. MIDOL was, was involved in many other research institutes. And we characterized what was later called the artemisinin partial resistance. As I explained, delayed clearance after using an artemisinin a drug or an uh, artemisinin combination therapy. Um, so this, this very rapidly, uh, thanks to the molecular marker tools, we discovered that there were multiple emergence of artemisinin resistance in different parts of the greater Mekong. And uh, WHO uh, worked with partners on an uh, emergency uh, plan to contain artemisinin resistance, but again, Due to the characteristic of, of this emergence of artemisinin resistance, the only option, as uh, Aryan uh, explained, was eliminating malaria uh, in the greater Mekong. And uh, the strategy was developed uh, by WHO with the countries and is currently implemented thanks to the massive support of the, of the Global Fund. Uh, and over now, the, the last six years, was, we, we saw tremendous uh, decrease of, of malaria in the region. Just an example, uh, last year we had still around 35,000 of PF in the Greater Mekong, and over the three quarters uh, of this year, we are less than 10,000 of P. falciparum, which is the multidrug uh, resistance parasite and which caused so much concern because uh, of, of uh, leading uh, an increased uh, morbidity in, in the region and uh, uh, with the risk of spreading outside. 
side, which unfortunately has not yet, uh, uh, and I hope will ne will never happen. So uh, this is more or less the the situation. As you know, we we have regular monitoring in the country. We have also a regular monitoring. And meeting with the with the countries uh, under the Great Mekong uh, Network of Drug Resistance, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, and this year we we have uh, some quite uh, um, encouraging data because at least uh, in the in the Mekong at least uh, two ACTs are working in each of the country. I mean, in Vietnam we know that artesunate mifloquine and artesunate paranaridine work quite well. Um, in Cambodia, they, these are the same drugs which are working. In, in Laos, we have, in addition, artemitalumethantrine, uh, which show quite high efficacy uh, this year. In Thailand, depending if you are Eastern or Western Bangkok, but uh, theoretically, you have also two ACTs. And in Myanmar, you have, uh, uh, which is less affected by the partner drug resistance, you have at least four ACTs working. So. Uh, the situation is is uh, is is uh, is better than 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 before, but still uh, worrying because we need to finish the job. We need to kill this remaining uh, 10,000 PF multi-drug resistance parasite. We must be extremely vigilant, and we need to take action as soon as we see uh, the last uh, two or three ACTs working in the region if they start to fail. So I will pause here. Uh, there will be many questions, and uh, we have uh, uh, we have time to to respond to questions if needed. Thank you, Jost. Thank you very much, Dr. Pascal, for this great introduction for this and uh, call for action. I think uh, that's uh, something I take away also from your opening remarks. So a, a few words about the format. So as you already heard, this is an online <laughs> webinar. Um, in the form of a kind of talk show, we have a number of guests who I will introduce to you in a second, including Dr. Pascal and Dr. Ayan. And I will ask them a few questions in a talk show style format, and then we use the remaining time to answer questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat box, and if possible, mention the person to whom you address the question, preferably not a question to everybody because that takes a lot of time and we want to make sure many people have a chance to ask a question. So you can also use the chat box to uh, make comments and share your thoughts. So please make heavy use of this opportunity. So um, I now have the pleasure to introduce you to our guests or panelists of today. I already introduced Professor Arjen Dondorp so not much more to say, but I wanted to mention that Ian and Dr. Pascal are getting up very early for this webinar. They are both in the Netherlands and in Switzerland um, in the moment. So the same for our next speaker, Dr. Caroline Bolton. She's the global he program head for malaria at Novartis. She's a veteran drug developer with over 20 years of experience working in the development and registration of innovative pharmaceuticals and is now committed to delivering transformative new malaria treatments. Um, Caroline has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Manchester. Welcome, Dr. Caroline. Then I go over to Ms. Evelyn Wong. She is the Regional Malaria Case Management Advisor at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, also known as CHAI. Um, she works in the greater Mekong sub-region and in partnership with national malaria programs of Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, and Vietnam to expand effective coverage of malaria case management. This includes working with government partners and Chai country teams to introduce new treatment regimes, strengthening trainings, and supportive supervision to ensure quality of care, as well as piloting new interventions to reach forest goers. Welcome, Evelyn. Then next, I welcome Dr. Marius Wojcicki, He's the head of clinical operations and deputy chief at the Department of Bacterial and Parasitic Diseases at AFRIMS. So he's a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel in the US Army, I understand. And um, he's actually a principal investigator on a number of clinical trials of antimalarial in Southeast Asia, leading a multinational team of physicians to advance Department of Defense Force health protection priorities for the region. And Marius, you're joining us from Bangkok. Bangkok, right? Welcome. And last but not least, I introduce Dr. Pascal. So I go to our last speaker, also based in Bangkok, 
Dr. Rungiran is a public health technical officer at the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the Department of Disease Control. He holds a PhD in tropical medicine from Mahidol University in Bangkok. And I think he's also joined today by his colleague, Dr. Rungrawi, also from the Division for Vector-Borne Disease. So she might also help if we have questions for our Thai colleagues. So welcome. And it's time to start our conversation. And you see now everybody on the screen. So maybe let me start with our uh, colleague from Thailand to hear more about the situation on the ground. So the GMS has been the epicenter of drug resistance. Resistance of malaria parasites to rt was first confirmed along the Thai Cambodia border in, I think, 2008. What is the status of drug resistance to the first line of treatment, ACTs or rt combination therapies in Thailand now? Dr. Rungiran. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for Thailand, uh, now we use the uh, artemisinin, uh, 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 sorry, DHA paper, DHA paper in along Thai Myanmar border and also in the whole country. But we use the pyrodivine in the Sisake and Ubon Lachatani only to provide that have the report about the system. Um, now Thailand have uh, some problem about the system along Thai uh, Cambodia border about the DHA paper system like that uh, here. And um, uh, Uh, nowadays, the, <clears throat> we try to monitor about the dark resistance at that to provide by TS, and uh, now we didn't include the malaria case from uh, PF case from that to earlier. Mm -hmm. We try to change from the TAS study to uh, in, uh, integrate that this is a survey or IDS for follow up the PILAMAC Pi because we have uh, some problem about the uh, uh, management in that two points. Mm -hmm. But the result is maybe just to improve some uh, make the stand in, in that two area. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. That's all. Do we have Thank any you. Yeah. We will talk more with you, Dr. Rung Niran, in a short while about uh, drug resistance in the Mekong subregion. So let me go over to Professor Ayan. He is also the chair of the Regional RT Medicine Initiative Steering Committee. Can you tell us? Is the situation sorry? Is the situation actually improving in the GMS, and what have been the catalytic initiatives driving the progress? Yeah, thank you, Yo. So a bit like uh, Pascal mentioned earlier, this this notice that the artemisinin resistance had emerged in in uh, Western Cambodia as a start, and then in the countries around here in the GMS really prompted an, an emergency response uh, led by WHO and the countries and uh, several research groups were uh, involved in uh, defining the problem. And uh, this led to a, a, uh, a plan to eliminate malaria from the region because that we realized that's the only way to get rid of this multidrug resistant malaria it would rid the world of this cradle of, uh, of drug resistance and it's, uh, it would take away the threat that we could not control malaria anymore if you don't have efficacious drugs to treat them. Uh, so WHO came up uh, with, with a comprehensive plan and then there was the global fund 
who put a lot of money uh, aside to eliminate uh, malaria here from the region. Uh, and we are now in the third cycle of this uh, so-called RIE grant, the Regional Artemis and Resistance Initiative. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, every three years, uh, more than 200 million US dollar for the five countries. Um, and it's coordinated by the usual global fund mechanism with the, uh, the country coordinating mechanism. But there's also a regional steering committee where all five countries uh, take part and all the relevant stakeholders. So the national malaria control programs, uh, civil society, very important. Uh, the NGOs are crucial in, uh, in executing the malaria elimination agenda private sector, uh, donors, uh, and, and other partners. Um, and that has proven to be a very, uh, a very successful uh, mechanism. Uh, you know, there's a lot of dialogue between the countries, all the different uh, stakeholders. Um, and as Pascal said, there's been made huge progress in uh, the elimination of, of especially for Cipra malaria. Uh, despite this uh, problem of multi-drug resistant fossil malaria, where you have to change your first line treatments regularly and the options are, are very, very limited. So uh, it's, it's going well. Uh, all countries now have committed to eliminate fossil malaria by 2023. Uh, which is very ambitious. Uh, so uh, everyone has to work very hard. And we hope that with the current ACTs, we will be able to finish the job. But as Pascal said, we have to monitor that, that very closely and we have to have tools and new drugs and treatment options in place in case that is not the case. Could be one of the, the points to discuss uh, later today. Over to you, Joost. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, so interesting picture. So 2023, so very ambitious uh, target. So anti-malarial drug efficiency is accessed through therapeutic efficacy, efficacy studies. So let, let me ask Dr. Pascal, um, can you share with the audience some details about the therapeutic efficacy studies, which is the gold standard to monitor drug efficacy, right? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Joost. Yeah, the, the therapeutic efficacy study was set up by WHO uh, a very long time ago in 1973, but it was uh, uh, updated and revised in uh, 1996 uh, to in its current format and then regularly based on the feedback from the people using it, the field, research institute or country, it was regularly updated. So we have uh, standard protocols for uh, low or very low transmission area. We have protocols for high to moderate transmission area. Um, so this is quite, uh, this is published and this is well known. So uh, in, in, in a couple of words, the therapeutic efficacy study is the gold standard that is used by a country to change its first line or second line treatment. You, so the, the therapeutic efficacy study is a prospective assessment uh, of the efficacy of a drug. You give a drug to a patient and you follow the patient over a defined period, which can be 28, 42, and you regularly monitor uh, the clinical symptoms and the, the parasitemia in the blood of the patient. Uh, and you look if this parasite and if the clinical symptoms disappear. If they do not disappear, it's a treatment failure. Uh, if it disappears, your patient is, is cured. Now, the problem is, is uh, checking if this treatment failure are due to resistance or to something else. You can have multiple factors which lead to a treatment failure. But then uh, if you want to really know if it's uh, a resistance, you need to use other tools. And one of the most often used and one is, which one is a real asset for the therapeutic efficacy studies is are the molecular markers. 
we have a set of molecular markers that are, are well defined and validated, uh, which, which can be used to confirm that the treatment failure is due to resistance. We have also some in vitro tests that are a little bit more complicated to use. And finally, we have also measurement of blood level of the drug to, to, to check if the, the, the drug use have reached the efficacy level in, in the blood. So we have, a, we have quite a, a panel of tools to monitor the efficacy or to monitor resistance uh, to uh, antimalarial um, treatment. So this is in, in the best case scenario, but as explained by, the, by our Thai colleague, uh, sometimes country and especially in the greater Mekong are facing a lack of, of patient. They could not find patient to do a, a, a good efficacy studies. And even today, I mean, Arian can talk about this, it's quite difficult to do clinical study to monitor new drugs because the number of, of patients with falciparum malaria are quite, uh, are quite uh, low, if not rare, in, in, in some places. So in this case, the country are moving to what we call an integrated drug efficacy surveillance, uh, which is integrated in their surveillance system and out of which you can extract some efficacy data. Uh, for, because countries that are targeting elimination must absolutely follow all the patients to be sure that they are cured and that they do not further transmit in order to, 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 to stop the transmission of malaria in this country. So you need to do a very, very uh, uh, stringent follow-up. And thanks to this follow-up, you can extract some, some efficacy data. So this is, in, in a nutshell, summarizing the therapeutic efficacy studies. Just to mention that the countries um, in, in the greater Mekong, including China at the time where they had malaria, have an excellent network of, of uh, of monitoring drug efficacy. They have their Sentinel site. It's, it's a very good network. We, they cover. In addition to that, we have some research institutes doing, doing additional studies. Uh, Moru does, MSF did, other, other partners, Afrims also. We, we have quite a, a very good idea of the efficacy of, of the ACTs in, in that region, which is quite unique uh, compared to, to other parts of the world. So I pause here and happy to answer any question. Up to you, uh, Jost. Thank you, Dr. Pascal. And uh, to our audience, please make heavy use of our chat box. Of course, we like to hear what you think, but also we would like to get questions as well. And you mentioned Afrims, Dr. Pascal. Dr. Marius, the US Department of Defense has supported malaria surveillance and drug resistance studies in Southeast Asia through the Afrims. So Afrim stands for Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences. So can you share with us a little bit about the work that AFRIMS is doing in Southeast Asia with respect to malaria drug resistance? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this um, invitation to be part of this discussion. I think um, it is an important meeting, important questions uh, to discuss, particularly for, for drug resistance. So thank you again for, for inviting AFRIMS to be part of this. Um, over the last few decades, um, Department of Defense has been heavily invested in the discovery of antimalarial treatments and the study of chemo prevention, so not just for treatment, but also for prevention of malaria. And our focus in Southeast Asia particularly has been on product development and developing the countermeasures uh, for the resistant strains of PF malaria. Malaria by us is considered an operational threat, particularly to the militaries, as it can easily compromise health security, uh, especially if we lose the effective treatments for, for malaria. So, but in order for us to work on product development, we have to understand how drug resistance changes over time. So we also heavily invest in, in surveillance of changes in, in, in vitro uh, and molecular markers of drug resistance. So in partnership with the Ministry of Health and regional militaries, we established a pretty strong clinical research team, particularly in Cambodia and Thailand, and also established laboratory support uh, to monitor for changes in drug resistance over time. Over the last few decades, uh, we have been collecting malaria samples from hard to reach uh, areas in Southeast Asia, uh, particularly focusing on the country borders. And we test these parasites against a panel of drugs. Uh, so we test these parasites not only against the first line treatments, but also older drugs that may play some role as drug resistance changes over time. And we also test these parasites against new promising drugs that may replace existing therapies. So currently we are conducting clinical trials of new drug combinations. And again, also testing these parasites in our lab against combination treatments utilizing in vitro methods. 
uh, recognizing that traditional approach to treatment with a single ACT may not be adequate, uh, particularly in countries such as Cambodia. We're closely monitoring the changes uh, to mefloquine, piperiquin, and pirinuridine, particularly because these drugs are very important to the national malaria program. However, we're also trying to focus on, on other drugs such as malarone, particularly because recently we published on 10% treatment failure with malarone from Cambodia, which was quite concerning uh, to the DOD as we are using malarone um, for both chemo prevention and for treatment. Uh, and also many travelers rely on malarone for uh, when they travel to malaria endemic areas. We're trying to better understand what has caused the high treatment value with malarone in, in countries such as Cambodia. More recently, we also added dafenequin to our in vitro work uh, to our drug resistance portfolio after it was introduced by the FDA for, for both treatment and for chemo, uh, chemo prophylaxis. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Marius. And let's talk a little bit more about existing treatment options against multi-drug resistant malaria. And I want to ask one more time, Dr. Pascal, and give him my next question because uh, the newest kit on the block might be Pyramax. It's, uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, new treatment option and would it be useful? Where is it used? Is it available? Yes, <laughs> thank you, Yoss. Yeah, definitely it's available. <laughs> so uh, artesinid pyrinaridine is the, the, the currently the last ACTs that was, the, this was developed. We have six ACTs available um, very, very briefly. Uh, artesinid amodiaquine, artesinid mifloquine, artesinid sulfadoxin pyrimetamine, which is less and less used uh, except in, 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 in India, but most of the country are, are stopping the use of artesinate uh, um, sulfadoxin pyrimetamine. <clears throat> then uh, antimetalumefantrine uh, and DHA uh, piperaquine, um, dehydroartemisine piperaquine. So paronaridine was a drug that was developed in the 70s in China and uh, was uh, recently developed as a, uh, uh, as a combination and, and ACTs with uh, artesunate. So the drug um, went through a phase three uh, studies in, in, in Asia and in Africa and was registered uh, in the EMA, in the European Agency, um, under the Article 58. So it's a drug which is registered and, and, and can be used. And, uh, uh, and the drug is also going to be registered uh, in, in the FDA. The, 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 the company is filing a dossier to, to register the artesanate pyronaridine in the United States. So the, the study went to phase three. three. Uh, the drug is pre-qualified. So uh, this means that it can be purchased by, by international uh, agency. Uh, it, it went through um, uh, the WHO Committee of Safety, the AXOM, um, because there were some concern about some, some liver side effects. But the, this committee considered that the drug was safe. Uh, it, it could be used. And this was based on, on two major studies conducted of more than, than 20,000 patients in Africa and children mainly of repeated dose, which uh, was the Wanicam study and the Quantum study. So this drug is, uh, uh, has, been, uh, has been extensively used in, in, in Africa. Um, currently, it's registered uh, in, uh, uh, it's, it's the second line drug in Cambodia and first line, uh, in, as explained earlier, in some provinces in Thailand and in Vietnam. And it's registered in more than, uh, than 20, it's, it's close to 30 countries in Africa have re registered the drug. Currently, in the WHO uh, treatment guidelines, malaria treatment guidelines, it's, uh, it's recommended as a drug for multidrug uh, resistance area, which obviously includes the, the, the Greater Mekong, but uh, there will be a revision of this uh, document early next year. And uh, we hope that this drug will be, the use of this drug will be extended to, to, to additional country because as I explained, there, there are other foci of, of drug resistance all over the world and it could be a, a useful treatment. But for the time being, if we consider the Greater Mekong, all the country have tested it and some of them have adopted it either as first line or as second line drug. Uh, in, in their respective country. Thanks. Thank you. Just. Thank you, Dr. Pascal. And um, so I understand Pyramax was introduced in Thailand, I think in 2019, as a first line treatment. And I think it was in, in two provinces in uh, Ubon Ratchatani, that's bordering with Lao PDR, and in Sisaket, that's the province that is bordering with Cambodia. So maybe I can ask Dr. Rungli Ran one more time. 
Um, can you let us know how this change was implemented? Thank you. Uh, we already applied in that two areas and uh, we found only four patients for PF in both areas. And that case is occurred before we launched the pylonidine in that area. So now we don't have any PFK for pylonidine in that two area. Mm -hmm. For PV, we still use the following in both area too. That is. Mm -hmm. Cup and cup. Thank you very much, Dr. Hongi Ran. And maybe let me turn now to, to Evelyn from Chai. So, in, in areas where resistance is a concern, how can we adapt the use of existing ACTs and rotate between those that are available? Thank you. Thanks, Jost, for the question. So, um, to my knowledge, we are not actually rotating ACTs in any of the GMS countries for now. And there are several reasons for this. Um, one, it, Operationally, it is quite difficult to have more than one ACT in circulation within the country uh, at one time. Uh, one reason is just for the small quantities, um, it becomes a high cost. And given especially the elimination countries that we are talking about, they will not need that many drugs. So the, they may not reach the minimum order quantities for manufacturers. So um, this is also where uh, UN Ops, Global Fund, WHO work very closely with global manufacturers to ensure that we have enough quantities that we can supply the, the countries with the drugs they need. Um, so in terms of supply, it is not such a huge problem, but having several different regimens in one country can be very complex. Also for the distribution planning for recalling any expiries that you need for training health workers. Imagine as a health worker having two different drugs that have different uh, dosages and treatments. Uh, it can be very confusing in one place. So what we often uh, recommend for countries uh, is that you, with your regimen to another, uh, recall all of the previous drugs that are not working anymore, resupply the new ones, and uh, and retrain and ensure that they are they are implemented properly. Of course, there there can be different considerations, and countries have different taken different strategies in regard to this. For example, when Cambodia switched from um, the HA piperaquine, when they found uh, resistance starting in 2014, they did this uh, in, in phases. They found, they uh, went from trialing it in a few provinces uh, in 2016, and then they moved to doing it in the whole country in 2017. And similarly for Vietnam, they have now moved to uh, change to Pyramax in the few provinces where they have found that uh, the HA piperaquine resistance is very high. So maybe this will move to the entire country eventually. Um, that's up to the country's decision. But these are some of the considerations you would want to have. Um, maybe I'll go a little bit into the whole process and why, why this is also important. Uh, when, when there's drug resistance found in the place, the, the process for changing drug regimens can be quite lengthy as well. First, um, we would need to have the drug registry in the country. And as uh, Pascal mentioned, mo a lot of countries have already looked forward towards the next step and already started to register the new uh, drugs that are effective in their countries because this process can take a while. Um, then you need to change the national treatment guidelines to ensure that the drug is um, can be used uh, as part of the guidelines, um, ensuring that there's a pre-qualified ACT is available and WHO also plays a big role in this, um, making sure that there's funding and budget to, uh, to procure these drugs. And then after that, of course, after the, the actual procurement, ensuring that there is a good uh, training and uh, distribution and use. So what we do recommend is for countries to start registering the second line treatments uh, as effective ACTs. And all the GMS countries are actually already have uh, um, artisanal pyrinaridine, the, the effective drug as a second line or in the process of registering this and uh, WHO, uh, Global Fund UN Ops are also uh, heavily working with the countries to ensure this the case so that once we actually find any drug resistance, you, you can, the second line treatment can kick in very quickly. The patients with treatment failure can get the right treatment at the hospitals and you can change the regimen fairly quickly. So I'll just stop here and happy to answer any questions later. 
Thank you very much, Evelyn. And this Game Changer series today is about innovation. So we have many compounds available to treat malaria. So far, they have been used in combinations of two, I understand. But I hear there is research now where you try to use a triple combination therapy. Professor Ayan, can you tell us a little bit more about this project? Yes, I can. So it, it's it's a bit in line what Ev Evelyn is saying, that at the moment uh, we have uh, the ACTs, where you combine the artemisinin with, with a partner drug. Uh, and when uh, there's artemisinin resistance everywhere in the GMS, if the partner drug also starts to fail, you see high treatment failure and you need to change uh, the treatments. Uh, which is operation, uh, very difficult to operationalize. Uh, we have examples from Cambodia in Vietnam that it took a few years, in fact, to change the first line treatment. So we have been developing triple artemisinin combination therapies where you combine the artemisinin component with two matched partner drugs uh, with different modes of action ideally with, uh, with uh, counteracting resistance mechanisms. Uh, and with that, you can prolong the lifetime of the combination a lot uh, because it's very difficult for the parasite to develop resistance against three different antimalarial compounds. Um, so we have been testing uh, two triple combinations at the moment, Artemisia lumifentrin plus amodiaquin and uh, DHA piperaquine plus mefloquine, which we now change to artesunate mefloquine piperaquine. Uh, and we found that they are safe, well tolerated, and uh, as you can expect, very efficacious, also in areas where, where ACTs uh, are failing. Uh, and we think it's very important to have these triple therapies ready, uh, especially for the GMS, but also in other countries, uh, if uh, the ACTs start to fail again. In fact, you could argue to introduce them now that we don't go in that, that recurrent cycle of waiting till the ACT fails and you have to change your first line therapy. Uh, other triples can also be developed. I think Mar Marius will, uh, will comment on that. Uh, we're also, of course, waiting for new compounds. I think Caroline uh, will, will comment on that. Uh, but that will take uh, quite a few years before they come to the market. So we really have to use the drugs we have at the moment uh, to remain efficacious. And we think that combining these in triple therapies is, is an important way forward. Over to you, Joost. Thank you, Ian. Let's bring Marius and Caroline into the conversation. Maybe a quick question to Marius and then over to Caroline. Um, so I understand that Afrims and um, I just mentioned it is leading a similar project on developing a new combination of treatments. So it sounds to me that this is a good option to use our existing tools in a better way, buying us some time. So what is Afrims doing? Can you tell us in a nutshell what are you doing? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. So I'm a principal investigator on an APEC trial. AP stands for atovoconfroguanol, so commonly known as malarone. And ACT stands for artemisinin-based combination therapy. So as the title implies, we're combining malarone with the traditional treatment of, of an ACT. The APAC trial was launched in response to the growing threat that malaria may become untreatable by available drug combinations, especially here in Southeast Asia. There were reports of superbugs detected in Southeast Asia, um, published by our colleagues, and that was highly concerning. And we also detected some signals in our drug surveillance that um, sensitivity to mefloquine uh, for parasites collected in Southeast Asia um, is declining. So we wanted to act early to make sure that we always have a backup plan for effective and safe malaria treatment. So that's how APAC trial was launched. Um, so this approach of combining combination treatments has been used for other infectious diseases. Uh, one example would be treatment of tuberculosis or treatment of HIV, both rely on combination treatments. So our approach in APEC trial is very similar. We're trying to use existing approved drugs under new combinations to make them more effective. 
even if the parasites have mutated and they have uh, markers of, of resistance. So these uh, parasites um, should be effectively treated by the combination of drugs uh, because they act by different mechanism of action. And we're also hopeful that these combinations can both protect Paramax and Malarone, uh, which, which are important to both treatment and prevention. When we were selecting the drugs, uh, we, we wanted to select drugs that are already registered to avoid some of the challenges that were mentioned earlier with implementation um, when new drugs are introduced. And also this study is intended to complement some of the other important work that is already being done by Moru um, where, when they are evaluating some of the other triple combinations. So, so, we're, so both studies I think will be complementary and will provide very useful data to the national air programs. So in, in summary, in terms of the treatment arms in, in, in our study, we have one treatment arm, which is Pyramax. The other treatment arm combines Pyramax with Malarone. And a third treatment arm combines Artesan and Mefloquin, which is first line treatment um, in combination with Malarone. What we found so far is that most volunteers, more than 80% of volunteers reported taking multiple tablets was acceptable. And this is important because um, uh, because these combinations have very high pill burden. So we wanna make sure that whatever we're evaluating is something that's, that patients would be willing to accept the next time they have malaria. And quickly, just from the preliminary findings from this study, which we presented at ASTMH last week. So we demonstrated a high cure rate for the treatment, treatment arms. However, we are still enrolling volunteers into this study for some of the challenges mentioned earlier in terms of declining cases of PF. Um, so we have to take these preliminary results with caution because we haven't reached the target enrollment yet. However, in terms of safety, um, it is reassuring that Pyramax and combination treatments with Malarone have been very well tolerated in the population enrolled so far. The addition of Malarone to Pyramax or addition of Malarone to Artesan and Mefloquin did not increase in any significant risk of hepatotoxicity or cardiac liability. So this is important because we wanna make sure that the combinations that are being recommended or proposed are proven to be safe because safety will be much more difficult to establish after they are deployed. And also the transient uh, liver enzymes uh, elevations that have been reported for Pyramax, we did not notice any increased risk mm. when Pyramax was combined with Malarone um, and uh, transient liver enzyme elevations have been consistent with what has been already published for Pyramax alone. Thank Over. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Marios. This, uh... Good developments, and I have we have with us today Dr. Caroline Bolton from Novartis. Uh, she's joining us from Switzerland, and she's leading Novartis' efforts against malaria. So new innovations could help us tackle drug resistance. So can you tell us a little bit more what the industry is doing, and of course also what Novartis is doing? Yes, thanks, Jost. I'd be happy to. So as we've heard repeatedly this morning, we need to come up with new agents with novel mechanisms of action, which are resistant to all known types of, of parasites, resistant parasites. And that's exactly what uh, companies are doing, collaborating between ourselves, working with the Medicines for Malaria Venture as well, trying to come up with these novel agents to which uh, there's, there's no known resistance. So we also are going to, to try and take the opportunity to reduce the pill burden for patients at the same time, because we know that if patients don't take their pills, as Dr. Marius said, it doesn't seem to be an issue for some patients. For other patients, it does appear to be an issue. So whilst bringing these agents forward, we're also trying to make sure that we simplify the way they can be taken. Novartis currently has two of the leading drug development programs that we're bringing forward to try and tackle, certainly tackle the resistance issue. They're both um, completely novel agents with new mechanisms of action. Um, they're both active against all known resistance parasites, which obviously gives us some confidence going forward. The first one, the leading candidate is CAF-156, also known as Ganaplasid. Uh, that's being developed in collaboration with the Malaria uh, for Medicines venture. It's actually just in the stage of clinical trials where we're trying to find the right dose and the right regimen. But we're testing this in adults and in children down to the age of six months simultaneously to try and make sure that we 
uh, we address the needs of, of the target population. The good news is it's active against both falciparum malaria and vivax malaria. It also has a really interesting profile because it has blood stage activity, so it can be used for acute treatment of malaria, but it also has liver stage activity and gametocytocidal activity as well, which means it has a potential for use in prevention settings and transmission blocking settings. So certainly while we're focusing on acute treatment at this point in time, we would love to explore this agent also in those, in those other pre-elimination settings. As has been said right the way through, we need to develop these agents in combination. We can't put them out there as monotherapy because that uh, bears too much resistance risk. So CAF-156, we're developing with lumefantrine, which is obviously part of one of the known ACT combinations at the moment. But we've actually optimized the formulation of lumefantrine, so it's more bioavailable. And that means it can be given just once daily rather than the current usage, which is uh, much more frequent during the day. So we're obviously, we've tested this uh, combination already in, in quite a large number of patients. It has very good efficacy rates and the safety also looks um, very good at this stage. We hope to be able to take it into confirmatory clinical trials, maybe at the start of uh, 2022. And obviously, we will do everything we can to make sure that we accelerate the development. And certainly, we'll look for ways to accelerate even further um, if we really see the emergence of true multidrug resistance, which is compromising the efforts uh, to eliminate in the greater Mekong region. Alongside uh, CAF-156, we also have KE-609, which is also called cipargamine. Again, completely novel mechanism of action, distinct from CAF-156. This one has blood stage activity, so can be used for acute treatment. Also, gametocytocidal activity, again, transmission blocking. The, the um, most notable uh, attribute of KE609 is its speed of action. It has the fastest speed of parasite kill that we've seen with any agent. And that obviously um, makes it very interesting for settings like severe malaria, where you've got hyperparasitemia and you want to bring those levels down extremely quickly. Given that artesunate is currently used in uh, IV is used in severe malaria, if resistance continues to develop to artesunate, then we're going to need an alternative to that, and we hope the KE609 will prove effective in that area. So again, we, we will bring that forward. We're going to take that into dose ranging clinical trials next year um, in adults and children, and we'll make every effort to bring these compounds forward to support the elimination efforts in the region. Thank you, Dr. Caroline. These are promising news. So let's talk a little bit about, about accelerating access. So we heard about uh, new treatment combinations as well as even probably completely new compounds altogether. So Dr. Pascal, for a new treatment, how can make these be made available to countries as quickly as possible? Yeah, thank you, Joost. Um, if I may, for the audience, quickly summarize what we heard here because it's quite important. So currently we have the ACTs, which is a combination of artemisinin plus a partner drugs. And I explained earlier, there are six partner drugs with artemisinin or artemisinin derivatives. Um, we saw the limits now of this, of this uh, combination uh, in, in the greater Mekong, but we see also here and there uh, some, some early sign of, of failure of the partner drug in other parts of the world. So there were, I would say three mainstream of, of, of new, new, uh, New, new, new drugs, which are, as explained by Caroline, the non-ACTs, which, which are interesting in the way that they have no artemisinin, and uh, we do not know how would the parasite react if we withdraw the, the pressure of, of artemisinin, which, uh, because we see changes when we change first line in some countries in, in the greater Mekong, we, we see changes in the, in the pattern of, of, of resistance of the parasites. Then we have the triple, as explained by Arian and, and Marius, uh, but it's not the only part of the world where it's tested in Africa. Also, there are this this uh, this um, triple uh, that are that are tested, especially in, in Africa, where they combine artemisinin and malarone, but makes a little bit complicated between 
because the the lumefan gene has to be given twice a day so it's it's a little bit complicated to to for the adherence and then uh, there are even people who want to extend the treatment to six days uh, which give two acts in a row uh, one after the other the advantage here um, is that we would have a six-day treatment of an artemisinin which on its own is also a treatment so this would be really three drugs uh, having on their own uh, uh, an efficacy against against uh, the 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 parasite so these are more or less what is currently be being developed um, so usually uh, in in uh, in who we we examine a, a drug in terms of pre-qualification in malaria treatment guidelines when once the drug is registered through a, a stringent regulatory authorities so once this is done and we try now because this was contrary to the past uh, example the antigenic paronarin where it was pre-qualified but not in the in the malaria treatment guidelines so we try to do now this in parallel when there are new drugs coming up that at the same time it is in the WHO treatment guideline and it's a pre-qualified drug which makes we do it in parallel which which makes things easier for country to to register now the question to be asked is uh, how would this look like for uh, already existing drugs uh, which we are combining i mean this uh, as explained this was the case in tb in, in hiv where they combine drugs so this is more or less an out of label and this needs to be really examined by by the by by the our our committee uh, policy making process and by the the pre qualification but nevertheless still this combination needs to be registered somewhere or uh, needs to have a a, a, um, a good dossier behind for this uh, for to be examined in terms of uh, of efficacy and safety the drugs are well known um, so i think uh, this could be this could be uh, go quicker but still uh, we would need a a, a dossier um, another part which can can speed up uh, is uh, is uh, what apple Mart did in the past uh, where they they call for country uh, the national regulatory authorities and give the example of one drug and this was the artesianate paronaridine just to show how the drug was registered on the uh, uh, stringent regulatory authorities not to push the country to adopt it but to show how the drug would, uh, was registered uh, what uh, what does the do dossier look like and how can the country uh, based on the knowledge they have and how, how they can look into a, a dossier of a stringent regulatory in order to speed up the process uh, uh, of registration as explained by many by many of the of the panelists here uh, it takes a, a lot of time and country um, do not register drug in fact the company do not um, want to register the the drug in the in the country because of the the small quantity uh, it, it has a cost for 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 everybody so uh, i think country countries definitely especially in the great mekong need to register this this drug and they could uh, uh, draw lessons from from stri other stringent regulatory authorities and here Applema uh, played uh, quite an interesting role of, of helping uh, the different country in, in the region of, of better understanding what is a dossier coming through uh, stringent regulatory authorities. Over to you, Just. Thank you, Dr. Pascal. Maybe a quick question to Dr. Marius. I mean, how can we work across sectors to ensure that these new treatment options reach the communities faster? Thank you uh, for this question. I, I think uh, partnerships are very, very important. We must always design the studies that will be of value in the communities where we conduct these studies. So before we launch any study, we have discussions with the National Malaria Program to make sure that everyone is in agreement on the approach and the treatment we're, we're set to evaluate. So we also consider what other studies are ongoing by our partners uh, or other um, um, key partners in each country to make sure that this cumulative data can be analyzed and decisions can be made by the national malaria programs. By engaging our partners early, I think this ensures that there's a path forward. In particular, AFRAMS is working very closely with the national malaria program in Cambodia and the regional militaries who participate as co-investigators on many of our studies. We want the partners to be engaged with the work we do from the very beginning so they understand the data and the gaps that exist from the data we generate. Ultimately, the decision will have to be made by the National Air Program, what interventions they want to introduce. Um, so this is not to say there won't be challenges. Uh, procurement of multiple antimalarials will be challenging, and this was brought up by some of the other uh, uh, speakers here today. Uh, but also, I want to emphasize, we cannot forget the militaries that are of particular high risk due to their occupational exposure when they patrol the borders. 
but as the numbers of malaria cases decline, um, the use of new combinations will be more feasible and can ensure everyone gets effective treatment, even when infected with highly resistant strains. So I think the bottom line is, I think engage with partners early, uh, make sure they are involved in these studies and they understand their data. So then um, they can facilitate uh, any sort of um, deployment that's needed. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayos. Um, Ian, you, I, I understand you wanted to share a quick thought about this question as well. Yeah, just uh, in line with what Pascal is saying, if you have existing antimalarials in the in the triple combination, what is needed to to get them being deployed and being uh, becoming policy? Um, because it are existing drugs that are all registered uh, on their own. Um, so as researchers, uh, it's very important to show that they are safe. The, the triples we have tested have been in over a thousand patients. But it's also very important to look in detail at the drug-drug interactions between uh, the different components. And you can find surprising things uh, like in our triples. I won't go into that, but we had to adapt uh, one of the triples because of those interactions. Uh, and you have to have the product available in a in an deliverable format. So, for instance, for Artemis Lumifentra and Amodiaquin, we work with uh, Fosun Pharma in China, who have now co-packaged uh, that drug uh, into one box so that they are readily uh, deployable. Um, so uh, just to mention some other components that, that need to be there to have it really available for deployment uh, as soon as, as they are needed. I think they, they could be implemented now, in fact. Thank you, Ian. So let me ask the last question. I hope the audience is shooting a lot of questions to, to my panelists here today. So what are the barriers that we need to overcome to allow patients to to have access to these new drugs uh, to address the emergence of resistance. And I want to ask this question maybe first to Caroline and then to Evelyn. So maybe Caroline, you take it first and then Evelyn, you back up. So I guess from a pure drug development standpoint, the path that we have to take, the barriers that we have to overcome are similar to, to developing a drug for any disease. We obviously have to go first into volunteers before we can safely go into patients. We find the dose in phase two clinical trials. Then we confirm the efficacy in phase three clinical trials. I think... Malaria becomes more complicated when trying to do clinical trials because of the different endemicities we have, the different seasonality. We have to plan much more carefully. If we miss a season, for example, then it can set us back a year in terms of the drug development timeline. So I think there are complexities about, as Arian said, I think, or Maria said, it's difficult now to find patients in some areas. So some of the areas where resistance is um, a real problem we can't actually find the patients. We can't conduct trials in a timely uh, or efficient manner. So maybe it is a challenge to, to get into the right places with the drugs during clinical trials. I think one of the problems that we have with malaria as well, where we're thinking about bringing novel agents forward is it's the uncertainty around the emergence resistance that, that causes a challenge for us as well how and when the resistance will emerge, to what element, which uh, resistance mutation we're looking for. It means we have to be constantly vigilant and looking out in the environment as well. And we don't always have the data at hand to, to know perhaps what some of our collaborators in the field are seeing to, in order to, to then be able to adapt with our drug development programs um, quickly enough. And I think then, as, as uh, Dr. Ringwald said, at the end of the process, it is quite a long process from the time when we've developed the drugs, when we're making our first regulatory submissions, through to actually getting the drugs out to patients, because we've got all those different steps. We've got the stringent health authority approval, uh, perhaps with pre-qualification then has to be adopted into the guidelines, has to be adopted by the malaria control programs. And obviously then the, the procurement agencies as well uh, need to come forward. So actually that can add a significant time lag from the time when we've actually produced the efficacy and safety data. And we would certainly like to see that being shortened. 
Thank you, Caroline. Evelyn, yeah, what are thanks. your thoughts? Yeah, thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, so I think Caroline has already uh, elaborated very well on some of the issues of even bringing the drugs to the market in the first place. And I think I will just address three more critical issues that we see um, in terms of getting it to the last mile and getting it to the people who need it. And the first one would be in terms of uh, market issues. So I mentioned already the supply and the concerns about supply and price, especially within eliminating country setting where the minimum order quantities may not be um, may not be very economic, et cetera. And that's where there may be opportunities for uh, countries to partner with each other to have a higher minimum order quantity, et cetera. Uh, another thing that is sometimes overlooked is pediatric dosing. When you already have such a small uh, number of patients and then an even smaller number of pediatric patients, sometimes uh, programs may not see it as worth it to get pediatric dosing. And that can cause some issues down the line in terms of uh, trying to split pills, et cetera. And, and that, it, that can be quite concerning in terms of safety. Um, the second major issue uh, is, or barrier challenge, uh, I would say is access, ensuring that every single person who needs the treatment uh, is able to get this. And uh, having a, a uh, good access to treatment, whether in the private or public sector is really important. I think that we have, um, and making sure that the passive case detection system is strong in order to uh, catch all cases of infection. I think the uh, NMCPs in the region have done a great, uh, a great role in, in improving access points uh, to care, for instance, with community health workers, but also in working with private sector to, um, to crack down on falsified substandard drugs, which were part of the reason for uh, emergence of drug resistance in the first place. And that has really um, seemed to have gone down over the years. So these partnerships need to continue um, and we need to, to keep uh, focusing on the last mile, even as we reach elimination, um, both in terms of uh, reaching reaching really rural communities and also keeping the focus on high risk groups such as the military. Yeah. And I think the last thing that we'll focus on is uh, quality, ensuring that we still keep uh, training healthcare workers, even as they see fewer and fewer cases of malaria, they need to know how to diagnose and treat them well, that they uh, keep having good supply of the ACTs that they need, and that we are also having uh, getting good data and working with governments to actually uh, ensure that that uh, treatment is actually provided well, which we actually now have a uh, very good data collection system. So we can actually uh, monitor these monthly and see whether uh, treatment uh, has actually been provided appropriately. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, we got a, a number of questions. Let me start with a question to Dr. Marios. Um, do you expect actually extra costs for the triple therapies and would this be a problem to the uptake by endemic countries, one of our attendees is asking. That's a very good question. And we've engaged in some of these discussions here as we were even planning for this study. The one thing I would say to answer this question is, I think as the number of falciparum cases significantly declined in Southeast Asia, um, use of these combination therapies is much more manageable because at a country level, you're not expected to use these combination treatments at a very high number. I think when we discuss the same approach for Africa, this may be a different economically because you have so many cases of PF, then maybe the cost would be quite high. But per country level, because the number of PF cases are so low right now, I think as we are approaching elimination, this is becoming more manageable. Particularly what we could do is deploy these combination treatments at a referral hospital. So clearly, I don't think this would be appropriate to use these combination treatments by all village malaria workers because we just cannot give every village malaria worker all these different drugs and basically have them decide how to use these combination treatments. However, if there is a PF case and there's relatively few of these cases now in countries such as Cambodia or Thailand, these cases could be referred to referral hospitals that have the access to these combination treatments and the cost, I think, on a country level would not be as high uh, with the rapid decline of PF cases in general. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Marius. Um, let me ask Dr. Rungiran and maybe also Dr. Rungawi. Um, they are sitting together. So um, there's a question. Thailand has to change treatment regimen frequently based on the evidences. Did you face a kind of challenge or what kind of challenges you face in implementing 
the revised treatment regimen in your country? Uh, actually, uh, the most important and challenging task for us is that how to synchronize or how to inform those uh, health facilities that the treatment guideline has been changed. So usually we plan in advance, it's like a, if you have a meeting of the National Drug Committee, something like that, and then if the, the first line drug is on chain or something like that. So we have to plan how to conduct or how to inform them either by training face-to-face -face or maybe send some documents to them. But anyway, we have to make sure that those who will use that new regimen are well informed. That is the most important and challenge time for us. Thank you very much, Dr. Hongrawi. So let me go with a question I received for Dr. Ayan, and I think that's a question many people maybe have on their mind. Uh, keeping aside resistance, ACTs have many limitations. Two serious limitations are, that's what our colleague uh, wrote, absolute contraindication during first trimester of pregnancy because of embryo toxicity, toxicity and uh, insufficient safety data regarding the use in pediatric cases. Any remedy you would suggest for these two groups of patients our attendee is asking? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's, uh, you could talk easily an hour about that. So pregnant women, uh, they are a vulnerable group evidently uh, because you have to protect the unborn uh, child. Uh, and it's a bit a catch-22 because uh, pregnant women are usually excluded from clinical trials. And with that, it's very difficult to gather uh, safety data on new drugs in pregnant women. So the ACTs are still not recommended in the first trimester of pregnancy. However, a lot of women have been exposed to ACTs uh, over the years uh, because in the first trimester, a lot of women don't know yet that they are pregnant and uh, a lot of data have been uh, gathered over the years. And in fact, the ACTs are much better than the current recommendation, which is seven days of quinine therapy plus or minus uh, clindamycin. That is a long treatment. Uh, adherence is a problem. It has a lot of side effects. And the outcomes of both the pregnancy and, and for efficacy of curing malaria is worse with quinine than with the ACTs. Uh, so a lot of, it, it seems to be safe also in the first trimester, uh, despite the, the observation in, in animal studies that, uh, that they could be harmful for, for the very young, uh, for the very young uh, uh, embryo. Uh, WHO has been discussing this a lot. Maybe Pascal wants to comment uh, on it. They are very conservative still in their recommendation, I understand, for legal reasons. But in fact, ACTs are better than quinine to treat malaria in, also in the first trimester. The second part uh, on uh, small children. Uh, well, ACTs have been used very extensively in children. Uh, artemisolumifentrin is now also uh, the label officially now includes uh, the, the very young and very small kids. Uh, so also there the concern is, uh, is going away. For the triple therapies, uh, we have been testing them uh, in uh, African children and we will do that much more extensively. And also the triple therapies uh, appear to be very safe and and reasonably well tolerated also in, in small children. Thank you, Ayan. Um, Dr. Pascal, there is also a question I see here. The countries where ACTs are used for both Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, does it have any relationship to drug resistance? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. But if I may first uh, just uh, echo what Ayan was saying. Um, uh, it's true that uh, regarding, first of all, 
I agree that quinine, doxycycline, and I'm not talking about pregnant women, but most often it's used at the second line treatment in countries. And this is quite, uh, uh, I, I do not believe that this can be um, highly uh, efficacious and implemented because of what seven day treatment, many uh, adverse event uh, twice a day, if not three times a day. So it's it's really not a good drug for the, for as a second line. So definitely countries should move to two ACTs. Coming back to, to, to pregnancy, and it's true that if you do a meta-analysis, including all the ACTs, uh, it, it, looks, it looks better than, than, than quinine. But if you, if you split them between the different ACTs, in fact, there is really one drug for which you have the most information, which is antimetalumefantrine. And definitely, these ACTs seem safe in the first trimester. For the other, uh, I'm a little bit more cautious. Uh, but again, this will be also revised very soon at WHO. Uh, the, the data I mean, you need a, a certain number of 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 of, uh, of pregnant women in order to 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 have a significant um, uh, uh, difference uh, or not. Uh, but definitely, antimetalumefantrine, you, you you reach more than 1,000 pregnant women uh, exposed to the drug, and and definitely this seems uh, safe. For the other, I think we have less uh, less information, but I think there are many studies uh, compiling, and I know that MMB is compiling more and more data on the on the first. Trimester. Now, coming back to, to the questions, um, I mean, uh, in the Greater Mekong, uh, still countries are using chloroquine, like Myanmar, like Thailand, like, like Vietnam uh, against Vivax. Only Cambodia and Laos are using both ACTs uh, against falciparum and, uh, uh, and, and Vivax. Uh, it's, it's, it's sure that you, you, put, you put more pressure uh, because you treat the, the, the parasite with the, the two species with, this, with the same drug, but still the number of cases uh, start really to decrease. I have no, I, I do not have evidence that uh, one uh, increased the resistance to the other. Uh, there is no resistance to artemisinin for, for plasmodium vivax. The advantage, I would say, using uh, the same ACTs for falciparum and vivax is for the mixed infection, because here at least you do not miss a deadly falciparum parasite uh, treated with chloroquine, which would be completely useless in the region. Um, by giving ACTs to, to vivax, especially if it's a mixed, uh, if the mixed infection was not detected, at least you are sure to cover the, the falciparum case. So um, to answer, uh, no, I do not, I do not see a relationship between drug resistance and the uh, there are pro and cons of using ACTs, and I just gave an example of, of one pro uh, of using the same drug for curing, uh, for treating both falciparum and vivax. Over, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pascal. And I'm seeing one more question going to Evelyn. So, Evelyn, giving the long lead to introducing new compounds, how can we use existing tools better? Are we doing enough with interventions like active case detection, mass tests and treat, or other models to accelerate um, PF elimination? So. Uh, thanks for this question. I think um, this is something that's definitely on a lot of programs' minds given the 2023 PF elimination timelines. How can we use our existing tools better? And the answer is we are doing active case detection in uh, most of the countries uh, using the existing surveillance data, uh, responding with uh, case investigations and uh, reactive case detection for all PF cases. And I think this can definitely uh, can be definitely continued in the in the following years. Um, some of the challenges associated with this is if the patient is actually uh, not contracting the case in the village and contracting in the forest, um, locating co-forest goers uh, and co-travelers, uh, especially as people move around, may be a challenge. But um, I would say that trying to reach um, more forest goers has been something that uh, many countries have worked on and seen a lot of success with. Um, one example would be the intensification plan, plan in Cambodia in uh, 2019 that saw a reduction sometimes of uh, more than 50% of case PF cases in, in uh, high burden areas. Uh, in terms of mass test and treat uh, and other models, I definitely would uh, also um, open this question to other panelists here who have been working on these issues as well. Um, I believe that other mass test and treat uh, interventions have not always found a lot more cases in the population, given the uh, low 
uh, levels of paracetamol that can be de- um, in the population and the fact that a lot of RDTs cannot detect um, that low level. Uh, so it may not be a very cost effective way, um, but I would open this up to other panelists for, for their thoughts. If, if that's okay with you, you asked, please. Yeah, we have another two minutes. Any final thoughts about that question? Any quick takers? Yes, I am. Yeah, well, maybe more in general. These last mile interventions, we, we really have to focus what's, which ones are the most effective and which ones are the most cost effective. Uh, so for the GMS, the, the malaria is really retreating in the forested area. So another effort that's going on, how to target forest goers and uh, to find tools and, and deploy tools specifically targeting this group. So chemoprophylaxis in that group uh, is one way, uh, way of doing it. Uh, testing specifically those, uh, those groups. If you have an index case, usually it's our forest goers to test his co-travelers and, and, and the risk group uh, around that is another important approach uh, that, uh, that is, is being now implemented in the GMS. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Ayan, I think we're coming to a close of our questions. Be- uh, if there are any more questions in the chat, uh, I am informed that we're going to request you, our panelists, to answer them via email later. And I would like now to invite Dr. Chanaki Amaratunga, who is the project coordinator for the DTEC project, DTEC standing for Developing Triple Artemisinin Combination Therapies. And she will. She was asked to help us to sum up a little bit the roundtable discussion in the form of some key messages and observations. So may I hand over to Dr. Chanaki? Thank you very much, Jost. Um, so thanks everyone for that very interesting uh, panel discussion on the innovations to address drug-resistant malaria. So I have five minutes to try to distill all the main points. So first of all, uh, we had a very nice summary from uh, Dr. Pascal and Dr. Aryan on the current uh, situation with regards to drug-resistant malaria, mainly from the Greater Mekong subregion, which is the epicenter for drug resistant, drug resistant. But as we also heard, it's not the only epicenter anymore. There are also, for example, with artemisinin resistance, South America has also become a center and also recently from Africa. So it's a worrying situation. And then in terms of uh, information on the currently available drugs and the tools to use these drugs more effectively, we heard that right now there are six available artemisinin-based combination therapies. And uh, the latest addition to this list is artesunate pyronaridine. We did hear about the studies that have been done with artesunate pyronaridine and how it has been now registered in more than 30 countries in Africa. And it is being used as a second line treatment in Cambodia currently, and also in Thailand in two uh, provinces, and also in Vietnam. So it is currently the latest addition to this list of ACTs. And uh, among the ACTs that have been currently used, we did hear that artesunate sulfadoxin pyrimethamine is currently being used only in very few countries, for example, in in India. So we don't have many options. We have only these drugs. And in the greater Mekong subregion, there is artemisinin resistance. There is partner drug resistance. Two of these ACTs in each country are working. And in some countries, a little bit more than that, three to four ACTs are working. So the strategy has been to rotate these ACTs. So when one fails, and the next ACT is introduced. And then we heard about the new drugs, uh, the new innovations using these existing drugs. And one of those uh, is to use a triple artemisinin based combination therapies. So here a third drug, so a second partner drug is selected from the partner drugs that are already available and it's added to the ACT. So it's it's in the form of triple ACTs. And the idea there is really to protect the first partner drug as well. So if if parasites are resistant to the the first partner drug, then the second partner drug could provide protection to that uh, first partner drug. And that is something that has been tested by Moru initially. And the drugs that were tested were artemithalumifantrin and amadiaquine and DHA piperoquine and mefloquine. 
and that has now been changed to artisanate uh, mefloquine uh, and piperoquine. And those two, two combinations have been shown to be very safe and highly tolerable and highly efficacious against artemisinin and piperoquine resistant parasites. And that's mainly in the Greater Mekong subregion. And currently, these drugs have been tested also in Africa in an ongoing study called DTAT. And meanwhile, we also heard from Afrim, so there's a, a similar concept, so using triple artemisinin based combination therapy. That's using the, the most recent ACT, artesanate pyronaridine, in combination with malarum. So there also the concern was because malarum is being used mainly uh, by travelers as well as prophylaxis. And there's been resistance to malarum detected when it was used as chemotherapy in, in Cambodia. So Afrims has taken a particular interest in combining uh, this particular ACT with, with um with artesanate pyronaridine. And that too, so, so the study is ongoing and the current data suggests that it is also very safe and very well tolerated and also engaging with the community. What they have also found out is that um, the, the patients are willing to actually take a higher pill burden because when it's three drugs, it does involve more drugs and there is willingness to, to take more drugs. And the efficacy studies are ongoing, but it's very reassuring to hear that there were no additional uh, effects uh, noted by combining the, two, the three drugs. And then in terms of the new drugs that are available, we heard from uh, Novartis that there are two leading candidates, and these are uh, cipargamine and ganaplaside. So CAF156 or ganaplaside is uh, currently uh, being tested and it's in, in clinical studies. And this is mainly for dosing and to find the right regimen in adults and children. And what's very important is that there is very good blood stage activity, but also liver stage activity and also gametocidal activity. So this could then uh, become a very important drug in the future. And it's been used, it's recognized that using it as monotherapy is not the best way to go forward with any of these new compounds. So right now it's been tested in combination with lumifantrine and uh, the lumifantrine dose here is also optimized and the lumifantrine used is in a way that is, it is more bioavailable. So it can be given as a single dose every day instead of twice a day. And preliminary results show very good efficacy and safe, the safety profile is also very good. And there is hope that it would, at the start of 2022, it could go into clinical studies for efficacy. And then the second uh, drug that is in the pipeline is uh, KE609, which is cipargamine. And this, one of the unique factors here is that it is the speed of the drug. So it's one of the fastest um, killing activities that has been seen. So it's proposed that it could become a replacement for artesanate, intravenous artesanate in case of severe malaria patients, in case there is artemisinin resistant to the extent that it cannot be used for severe malaria anymore. So that uh, the testing will be uh, conducted next year for dosing and the regimen. And uh, then in terms of um, accelerating access, so all of these drugs, so these new compounds, triple ACTs are all in the testing phases, but then they need to become available to the country. So then what are the problems in, in deploying these drugs? And one of the most important things is, is that the drugs need to be pre-qualified by WHO, be in the WHO treatment guidelines, and they need to be registered by the countries. So the, the, one of the main messages here is to engage with the countries at a very early stage, engage with the WHO at a very early stage, not to wait until you have all the results from a clinical study and then go into uh, trying to get the drug registered in the country. Because it, we know that based on previous drugs, for example, and to take draw lessons from other drugs like artesanoid pyronaridine, to start early, uh, to prepare the dossiers which are required and to prepare the dossiers with a very uh, stringent regulatory authority and have the documents ready, have the data and the evidence ready and go through that registration as quickly as possible. So, and and the, even then there, there are problems once the drug is registered there is the cost of the drug. So you need to prepare to have the funding to get the drugs into the country. And, and in, for example, countries like uh, the Greater Mekong subregion, the amount of drugs needed would be much less than in Africa. 
So in terms of cost for a triple ACT, as was discussed, that could become advantageous in that the additional cost could become less given that you need less drugs, but then would the country invest in getting fewer drugs? So that becomes a problem. In Africa, an added cost needs to be considered since it has to be deployed in a much larger population. But again, all of this um, has to be thought about early and not waiting until, uh, for example, researchers uh, have the, the last result and then try to uh, uh, get regulatory approval. So it should be done concurrently and especially very importantly with the country partners because it will be the national malaria control programs that will be making these decisions as to which drug they will be using in case of uh, failure of drugs that are currently being used. So just, I could end there and hand it over back to you now, since I've reached the end of five minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Chanaki. This was an excellent and very detailed summary. I think you all agree. And so this is more or less all for today. Let me start first of saying thank you to all our panelists and speakers today for taking the time to be with us and sharing your expertise and knowledge. So uh, I hope the audience had some very interesting uh, takeaways from our fourth edition of the Malaria Game Changer series. Uh, little warning, we are going to have the last round table of the series only in a week from now. And the title is Medicine Quality and Innovations to Detect Substandard Falsified Medicines in the Asia, in Asia and the Pacific. So I hope many of you will be able to join us. Again, we have a wide range of experts uh, being on the panel in a similar format. So looking forward to see you all and have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And for the colleagues all joining today from Europe, uh, maybe have a second breakfast. I think you have definitely deserved it. You have to get up very early. And for the colleagues in Bangkok, have a good afternoon. And so see you soon and have a good day. Bye-bye.